The far right in Britain still thinks that white people are threatened by waves of black immigration. John Tyndall, the leader of the British National Party, hasn't changed his mind about this in the past 25 years. Multiracial Britain isn't irreversible. The human will and the human intelligence can avoid disastrous policies if we decide that we should avoid them. The big idea may have stayed the same, but there's a difference between the old far right and the new. Size. Two decades ago, Tyndall led the National Front, one of the biggest far right parties in Europe. Now the movement is tiny and divided. This film is about the long journey into oblivion. The decline of the British far right has been defined by one event the 1979 general election. The National Front has put up a record 300 candidates. But it ended in disaster. Every single candidate lost their deposit. Well, I remember things being very, very hectic and feeling that we could be on the edge of a breakthrough. But as it turned out, we were not on the edge of a breakthrough. And we suffered a setback. The whole of our cause suffered a setback after the election of 1979. It was a bitter anticlimax to a decade in which the National Front had seemed unstoppable. Leicester was one of its strongholds, thanks to immigration. Thousands of Asians arrived expelled from Africa. Within a decade, almost a quarter of the town's population was non-white. Locals were shocked. I joined the National Front because I felt at the time uh, that the, um, the established parties were not taking any notice of you know, the people. And uh, uh, I felt it was the only way uh, of expressing my views at the time. I think that, um, that people were concerned about feeling foreign in their own environment. The party's leaders were an effective double act. John Tyndall was the posh one. Martin Webster, the voice of the people. If you've got a black face, you can't speak a word of English, you've got no loyalty to this country, you've got six wives, you can have social security. People wonder why we're growing in Leicester. That's the sort of reason why we're growing in Leicester. Leicester's local council also opposed immigration. It put an advert in a Ugandan newspaper urging Asians to stay away. The local newspaper agreed. In local elections, the National Front rose from nothing to take almost a fifth of the vote. I really, really did believe that we were going somewhere and we actually could change the political face of this country. The consensus behind the front's anti-immigration platform wasn't to last long. On the streets, the front's marches led to violent clashes with their opponents, the Anti-Nazi League, and NF supporters persecuted Asian families. Stones thrown to the window, my brother's been beaten up going to and from school. Racial abuse. We had people trying to put obscene things to the letterbox. The right wing suddenly showed their true colours. They were opposing black people coming to this city because they hated them. And hate was not too strong a word to use. <laughs> As the front's extremism became more apparent, the media became more hostile. 
It spotlighted the leaders' dubious histories. Mr. Webster, may I ask you a, a personal question? It's been reported that at one time you were a Nazi. Yes, that's true. Is that true? May I ask you why you became a Nazi? Yes, uh, this was in 1962. I was 19 at the time. The other half of the NF leadership, John Tyndall, had in the 1960s dressed up in jackboots, celebrated Hitler's birthday, and mounted paramilitary-style operations in the countryside. One only has to look at his speeches and the little speeches again, I say, of Nuremberg, and the parallel is there for everybody to see. No power on earth is now going to stop this movement that we have created. No power on earth, no threats, no lies, no words, no laws are going to stop us. There was more to the Nazi image than speech-making and uniforms. Tyndall had a fully worked out theory. Black immigration wasn't just undesirable. It was a big conspiracy organized by Jews as part of their plan to destroy the white British race. In the early 1960s, his own journal had been blatantly anti-Semitic. In an early issue of Spearhead, one of the things which was published was that Jews are a race of unheroic, greasy, shifty-eyed, sickly moneylenders, wrench racketeers, pornographers, and big business wide boys. If Britain were to become Jew clean, she would have no nigger neighbors to worry about. It's the Jews who are our misfortune. How much that do you still Would you about? like to quote the particular issue? Because I don't remember that being said. I do know that things were said in those days which we would not say today because our political thoughts have, have evolved on from that time. Yes. But uh, I, I would like to know the issue where that was said. Number two, page five. Number two, page five. Okay. Now, will you, will you please just um, stop these proceedings for a moment? I can go and obtain issue number two. And I'd just like to satisfy myself that, that was said. Okay. Do you still agree with any of that? I think that was too much of a generalization. I think that you should attack individuals rather than attack whole groups in that way. So I, that's, that's not the way I would put it now. I would concentrate on specific individuals who deserved that kind of description. Immigrants have now had three decades to settle into multiracial Britain. Race mixing is a reality. Today, Tyndall leads a different political party, at least in name. He still believes it's the Jews who are behind it all. Do you honestly believe that the Jews are conspiring to undermine the British race? I said some Jews. I didn't say all Jews. No, but a, a large enough number to, to form a conspiracy. I think a conspiracy which has many facets and certainly many Gentile agents as well. The notion of conspiracy was to become ever more important in far-right mythology. When the National Front's vote collapsed in 1979, it didn't blame itself. It blamed the same conspiracy, organized by Jews and assisted by establishment collaborators. We quickly concluded that we'd been robbed was basically our opinion in electoral terms. But then the, a lot of the more conservative elements in the party uh, were just very shocked by it, hadn't realised how the establishment, as they saw it, would stitch them up in this way. Ever since 1979, the far right has tried to outwit this establishment conspiracy. Its attempts have taken it on a 20-year journey of bizarre, ideological twists and turns. Each new departure contained a new plan to defeat the conspiracy. And each one ended in failure. After 1979, there was a power struggle. John Tyndall was forced out. He formed the British National Party Effective control of the NF passed to his old partner, Martin Webster. His response to the conspiracy was attack. In a memo to members, he wrote, 
the establishment fear that continued NF activity could be the spark for an explosion which could blow their rotten multiracial society to bits. We are going to confront our oppressors with an increase of audacious activities. Rather than striking at the heart of the establishment, the audacious activities were mostly confined to schoolchildren. Racist comics were circulated in the playground. I think that they are written in good, honest, straight, simple language for young people and they convey very simple, basic ideas of patriotism in a way that's acceptable and appreciated by young people. And as propaganda, they're brilliant. Only 10 pence a copy. Bulldog was the National Front's youth magazine. It had been founded in 1977 by 16 year old Joe Pierce. For Bulldog, the conspiracy against the National Front started in the classroom. When I was at school, my particular school, which is not one of the most heavily immigrant populated ones, and uh, it's not in one of the worst areas of London, that was inundated with communist teachers. And most schools in the East End, which the Pope was supposed to go to, is most definitely in a date with red teachers. It makes me sick. Oh, lovely, yes, to have a big nose, right? Come on then, yes. Bulldog encouraged pupils to denounce left-wing teachers. Now, Adrian. It has big ears. It has big ears. Well, I wouldn't like to be called big ears. Dear you? sir, I am writing ears? to inform you of another teacher to put on your Bulldog blacklist. He has been known to advocate socialism and multiracialism to his pupils. He also expressed... And I would love to get my own back on him by seeing his name printed in Bulldog. The NF. I have taken the trouble to find out his address. It is... He made his students paint a hammer and sickle during a history lesson, and he encourages discussion of Marxism in the classroom. His name is Stephen H. Harrowell. In 1980, I was a new history teacher at a secondary school in Dover. I was uh, teaching the history of the Soviet Union, as was part of the school syllabus. And one afternoon, uh, two young thugs burst into the classroom. Uh, we had an altercation in front of a class full of 13-year-olds. Um, I felt physically threatened. They certainly verbally threatened me. I was accused of indoctrinating the minds of young British people with foul communist ideas, basically. Were you a communist? No, I certainly was not. Um, it just so happened that year group, year nine, uh, we were doing a term on the Soviet Union to be followed by a term on the United States of America and a term on the history of Africa. Following the attempt on his lesson, Harrowell and the school became the focus of further National Front activity. Other teachers in Britain had petrol poured through their letterboxes or were beaten up. But vandalism and intimidation failed to bring down the multiracial society. Joe Pierce, editor of Bulldog, was jailed for racial hatred. Membership dwindled. And in elections, the NF still lost its deposits. For Harriet Harman, Labour, 11,349. For John Allen Redwood, 2,800. For Martin Guy Allen Webster, 874. The party desperately needed a new idea. Elections didn't work. Attack didn't work. In the next stage of their self-inflicted decline, they decided to rise above the multiracial conspiracy. The National Front turned to God. They would become saints. I think we really did feel that we were higher above the other parties and that uh, by becoming a sort of a new person, a new man or whatever, that, uh, that the other parties just would not be able to, to cope with the, 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 the purity of thought and the, the ideas that animated these people. The man who brought them these ideas was no saint. Roberto Fiore was an Italian neo-fascist on the run. 
the Italian police also wanted to question him about people they suspected of the bombing of Bologna railway station, in which 80 people died. The fugitive got a warm welcome from young NF members. Roberto was certainly a very charismatic figure. He was a very young leader of um, uh, the section of the nationalist movement in Rome. Um, a very uh, magnetic personality with a great deal, at the time, a great deal more experience of political organisation. Fiore persuaded the front to remodel itself on the pre-war Romanian fascist movement, the Iron Guard, which combined orthodox Christianity with a loathing for democracy. Its leader was the magnetic Captain Corneliu Codrianu. For a party trying to escape the Hitler tag, Codriani was an odd hero. He thought the Nazis were soft on Jews, and his slogan was long live death. Long live death, I'm, I'm sure it was meant in this way, that if you're prepared to say, not just I don't mind dying, but I'm happy to die for my beliefs, then what can your opponents do against you? Codrianu organized his followers into cells of elite cadres, the National Front did the same. They called themselves political soldiers. A key ideologist was Derek Holland. He had an austere view of the life of an NF activist. There must be analysis and study. Analysis and study devoid of personal interest, devoid of vague sentimentality. Study and analysis being central to our method. Holland, a devout Catholic, wrote pamphlets to explain the new Christian discipline. Many members were baffled. Derek Holland had some rather strange views that uh, we should all become political soldiers and um, almost be a form of an elite, you know, to, you know, to run the, the party and the country and all this type of stuff. And one mustn't go out and, you know, drink beer and smoke cigarettes and presumably do what most normal people do. One should spend all one time being a political soldier, whatever that meant. Another obscure thinker Roberto Fiore introduced the NF to was Julius Evola. Evola was a fervent admirer of the Nazi SS and had advised Mussolini on racial policy. Both he and Codrianu despised conventional politics and thought the only way to unite the nation was to create a new Superman. The NF agreed. There was a feeling that if we are to win, we've got to have something far more than ordinary politicians. So to our politics, we had to bring a soldierly discipline and devotion. It's actually farcical, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you must have, somebody, some people must have believed it. Uh, some people did. I mean, it's... it's uh, you yeah, know, what planet are we on, please? Uh, can I, uh, you know, welcome to the planet Earth again? You couldn't recruit along these lines uh, because people think you're just balmy, quite frankly. And uh, let's face it, um, the organisation was, uh, was decimated. Like Codrianu, the political soldiers believed that once the new man had been forged, he should return to his community. Isleworth in West London was to become a testbed for the new community-minded nationalist. That individual would then act as a beacon for their community. Uh, so then we'd say, right, well, now you know what it's all about. Well, now find problems that need sorting out on your estate or in your area and sort them out. Just do them quietly. And you don't particularly tell people you're doing them because you're political. They know you're political, they will know. Uh, and then from that, we will gain grassroots support in certain areas. Uh, and then, once we have credibility in certain areas, then that'll, or success in certain small areas, that'll then give us the credibility externally. It was a way of outwitting the establishment conspiracy. It meant National Front policies without the National Front name. The political soldier keenest on this idea was Phil Andrews, a man with convictions for violence and drunkenness. In 1984, he set out the strategy for NF community activists. Members must be encouraged to join or set up tenants or residents associations. 
Taking control is likely to be child's play for two or three dedicated political activists. In Iselworth, Andrews set up a number of community groups. Today, he's no longer in the National Front. He's an elected councillor for his own party, the Iselworth Community Group. He refused our requests for an interview, but we caught up with him leafleting one morning. Mr Andrews, Jolly and Jenkins from the BBC. Yes, so there you are. Hello. Why did you organise the South Isleworth Community Group when you were still a member of the National Front? Uh, there's never been a South Isleworth Community Group. Isleworth South Community Group. Um, because I've, I've been keen on the idea of community politics for quite a long time. At the time, I still had uh, certain views which... Um, you could you could say were uh, racist or nationalist um, but I was becoming to believe in the community idea by building power in the community the NF wanted to outflank conventional corrupt politicians one man had had this idea before Colonel Gaddafi he became the latest in the NF's parade of unlikely heroes in West London Phil Andrews was his number one fan. Are you still a, a, a follower of Colonel Gaddafi? I was never a follower of Colonel Gaddafi. Are you um, in favour of his political views? Um, will you excuse me because I'm going to get the place. I'm going about my ordinary, everyday Just asking business. you a question. Yes, and I've already discussed this with you. Um, I'm not a follower of Colonel Gaddafi. But in 1989, while on the National Front Executive, Phil Andrews presented the local library with a copy of Colonel Gaddafi's Green Book, which contains his ideas on an alternative to Western democracy. But you, you gave a copy of the Green Book to the library and praised Colonel Gaddafi That's right. to the skies for his ideas on democracy, which seem very similar to yours. Where Colonel Gaddafi or anybody else supports the idea of popular democracy, I applaud him. Colonel Gaddafi thought that parliamentary democracy was a fraud against the people. The National Front thought so too. But it wasn't just his ideas they liked. In 1987, leading members of the party went to Libya in search of petrodollars. In our minds was the fact that uh, Libya is a small country awash with oil money, uh, and if we want to build a serious nationalist movement in this country, we need to attract serious money. So had we been offered it, we'd have been very pleased to take it, and we hoped that we would be. All they ever got from Gaddafi were bulk copies of the Green Book. It proposes a new sort of democracy based on an intricate system of people's committees. And so do recent election leaflets for Councillor Andrew's new party, the Isleworth Community Group. But Gaddafi's ideas never really won over the people of West London. A copy of the Green Book uh, that Phil Andrews lodged at Isleworth Library um, was never actually checked out by a reader. So it would seem on the basis of that that there was very little evidence of an interest in the, the ideas of, of Colonel Gaddafi uh, in Isleworth. <laughs> Gaddafi's Arab nationalism showed the front that there were other people with nationalisms of their own. The stage was set for yet another ambitious but self-defeating change of direction for the ever-dwindling front. They became pro-black. From the late 80s, they started championing black nationalists like Louis Farrakhan. They saw them as allies against the multiracial conspiracy. Black and Asian people who are committed to preserving their own racial and cultural identity have far more in common with us than we have with race-mixing white liberals. The NF now respected black people, although it still wanted them to leave the country. But to many members of the rank and file, civility to blacks was going too far a branch somewhere in the north of England, I think it may have been round Manchester. They sent their papers back, they circularised us all with a handwritten note saying basically they, were, they didn't like this sort of thing. The National Front should just be a white person's organisation and basically they were off. 
as an attempt to undermine Britain's multiracial society, teaming up with foreign nationalists made sense. They could make friends with Arabs. They could make friends with blacks. Then in 1989, one of the front's leading members tried to open a dialogue with the oldest enemy of all. It was to cause the end of the National Front. I was phoned out of the blue by Patrick Harrington because he said he had a, a good story, a big story to tell me about. And he arrived at the Jewish Chronicle in his trademarker full-length leather coat, yeah, which was sort of slightly sinister. And we went next door to the uh, pub. And then he started to tell me what was quite uh, a, a explosive story, which was that the National Front, which was uh, traditionally uh, considered a uh, and uh, if not a, a Nazi party, a sort of neo-fascist or crypto-fascist party, had decided that uh, it had been historically wrong in its attitudes towards the Jews. Despite the Jewish Chronicle's sceptical reporting of the issue, the majority of the party were horrified at Patrick Harrington's tactic. Patrick's approach to the Jewish Chronicle had not been discussed before it appeared. Uh, and in any leadership which is supposed to be a group leadership, that was clearly unacceptable. Um, that, as much as the message, was unacceptable. As I say, the message, yeah, I personally at the, at the time felt that that was going too far. Nick Griffin came to see me. Um, the, the, ostensibly, it was to look at the price of property, houses and such like in Belfast. But then uh, it developed to a discussion about the way the movement was going. And he was unhappy that, um, that some elements were opening up a rapprochement to the Jewish community. So he basically wanted such elements expelled and to keep the National Front going purified and renewed in, in this trend. Uh, or failing that, that a new group would be set up. Within a few months, the National Front, or what was left of it, had been wound up. The name was abandoned. The remaining members split into two camps. We probably had something like 50 or 60 people, and Patrick Harrington's side had uh, 10 or 12 people. You're talking about tiny numbers of folk uh, who've managed very successfully to uh, build themselves a ghetto within a ghetto within a ghetto. The biggest fragment called itself the international third position. Today, it communicates with the world only through the internet. Its solution to the multiracial conspiracy is to cut itself off from ordinary society. The circle of conspirators has been enlarged. Not just the Jews and the media, but abortionists and city dwellers. They want to go back to the land. Only if we can put ourselves back in touch with the soil of these islands can we have a revolutionary politics that is both attractive and popular and which is vibrant with life. In other words, if we do not espouse ruralism in theory and in practice, we are no different from the deadbeats of the establishment. The place they chose to get in touch with the soil of their nation was surprising. They've set up a nationalist commune in France. They speak of their struggle to build a new society based on hard work and prayer. Getting your hands cut to shreds on briars or mixing concrete for 10 hours in torrential rain leaves you with bad hands and a bad back. If there are any Christians out there, they can remember this project in their prayers because the spiritual struggle is the highest and most important. The international third position send out leaflets appealing for money to support this mysterious commune. Funds are urgently needed. They've always been very secretive about the location of the French Commune, and it soon became clear why when we tracked it down to a small village in Normandy. The deputy mayor unlocked the town hall to show us the records. The property was in the name of the wife of the front's Italian guru, Roberto Fiore. Only two people had regularly visited, and one of them had left in 1994. The other, Derek Holland, had supposedly gone to Italy. Once, they had had big plans. 
ils avaient parlé de construire une chapelle. On a parlé, mais on, on a... a parlé dans la portée. Non? <rire> oui, Et ils ont demandé un permis de construire. Hein? Pardon? Ils ont demandé un permis de construire, mais il y a longtemps. We went to see the place for ourselves. I took a look round this nerve centre of spiritual nationalism. It was deserted and run down, but there were signs of religious fervour. Supporters are still getting sent begging letters, yet the property is actually up for sale. Quel espèce de gens habite ici? Là, vous savez, ils ont pas tellement habité. Hein? Uh -huh. Pas tellement. Hein. Oui, ils, mais, ils, mais, ils, mais... Ils venaient un jour, trois semaines, quoi. Ils, ils allaient et venaient. Uh -huh. Oui, oui. À, à Londres, à la, oui, à la oui, cité? Sans doute, oui, sans doute, oui. C'est oh, oh, oh. les vacances ici. <laughs> oui, c'est ça, oui. Meanwhile, in 1989, Patrick Harrington renamed his half of the National Front the Third Way, not to be confused with Tony Blair's initiative of the same name. They've abandoned the conspiracy theory. Nowadays, the Third Way's most active member is Brent Cheatham, who campaigns in Cuffley, part of commuter belt Hertfordshire. He writes a local newsletter, which he distributes himself. At the last general election, he got 0.3% of the vote. Cheatham joined the National Front back in the 70s. He used to be a bit of a racist. Did you ever think there was a Zionist conspiracy to take over the world? I think, actually, to be honest with you, I probably did. That was almost part and parcel of the organisation at that time. So you couldn't have... Big an anti-Zionist, anti-Semite. Yes, yes. Uh, I would say that was the case. The Third Way have done their best to take racism out of British nationalism. In Cuffley, they say culture, not race. Globalisation, not international jury. Any repatriation is to be voluntary. Our way of life is still under threat, but it's not part of a master plan. I don't believe that there's a conscious conspiracy people were actually wanting to control the world. But you do believe that there are forces, global forces, which have the effect of undermining cultures and this is a bad thing? Yes, I do. I do believe so. But how can a British nationalist fight those global forces if he doesn't want to send the blacks back, and if he doesn't blame the Jews. In his newsletter, Brent Cheatham tackles all kinds of issues in the interests of the British way of life, from pelican crossings to footpaths and beyond. This is another thing we have campaigned on. These were the toilets at North or Great Woods. These toilets were closed down some considerable time ago. We have been actively campaigning for these toilets to be reopened. People travel miles around the country, get to, these to, uh, to this place, hoping the toilets are going to be open, and indeed their advertising literature has been open, only to find that they're closed. A prestigious site such as this, as you can see, the car park is full, should have basic facilities such as a toilet. With the National Front splintered into virtual oblivion, the way has been left open for the return of the old man of the far right. When he left the front in 1980, John Tyndall forms the British National Party. Today, the BNP has become Britain's only significant far-right organisation. In yet another attempt to repackage British nationalism, it's adopted the vocabulary of modern politics. But it's proved difficult to leave old ways behind. <laughs> Birmingham's modern racial nationalists, Mr. White, Mr. White, and Mr. White. Nowadays, the far right like to campaign on the same issues as the big parties, like housing, education, and the single currency. They're ordinary folk, just like you and me, if you're white. We want our own way of life back. We want it Sunday afternoons, you know. Um, the fellas have a, a drink at the pub and then come back home to a Sunday lunch. Not 24 hours shopping and corner shops open till 10 o'clock at night. I don't feel that we should be apologising in our own country for wanting to retain 
mm. our heritage and our way of life. It's this is part and parcel of the new modern nationalists. It's organised, it's out there in the communities. We're there actually listening to the people, serving those people. The man coordinating the new politics is the former NF political soldier, Nick Griffin, now the BNP's number two. Last year, he was convicted of racial hatred. He rears pigs on a remote farmstead in Wales. From here, he directs the BNP's latest battle with the establishment over paedophiles. The lenient treatment by the establishment for paedophiles it's probably the worst example, in fact, of the wishes of the people being ridden roughshod by a liberal elite. Uh, and we're opposed to that liberal elite, and we want our people's views acknowledged and recognised. And since no one else is standing up for the rights of our children, then we're standing up for the rights of our children, because the opposition only seem to be concerned about the rights of paedophiles. For many years, the village of Wing in Rutland has housed low-risk ex-offenders in an old mansion on the outskirts. Then last year, residents were outraged to discover it was to house a convicted child sex killer. One morning, they woke up to find they had a new ally. The BNP had delivered leaflets to everyone in the village. Well, I just uh, screwed it up and put it in the bin. You know, I, I'm, I don't know a lot about them, but uh, what I have heard, I, you know, I don't, I don't like what they do and how they go about things. So that was it. I just, you know, screwed it up, put it in the bin. Quite frankly, I just binned it. I couldn't see what the BNP really had to do with a local issue. But some villagers did seem to support the BNP. A letter appeared in the local paper. Yesterday, a leaflet from the British National Party landed on my doorstep, and very refreshing it was to read. At last, there is one political party out there with an ounce of common sense. I know where my cross will go come the next election. Next week, there was another letter. But the authors hadn't counted on the watchful eye of one local councillor. I know Wing quite well. I drunk in the pub there. I have been a candidate in elections there. I saw those names and thought, hang on, I don't recognise those names. The second letter came from, or purported to come from, an address at number 31 on a road where there were only two houses. That did make it quite clear that this was a made-up name and address and also written by someone who did not know the area, who did not know there were only two addresses on that road. Why have your members been writing fake letters to the local paper from fake addresses, claiming to be ordinary members of the public who have been Im impressed by the BNP? I don't know if people have or if it's a smear, but if they have, I'd say... You think somebody is pretending to write to the local paper, pretending... No, I, I think the, the, opposition, the opposition may have done it, or a journalist may have done it. The conspiracy rears its head again, and it's used to justify another well-known feature of the British far right, violence. This is the BNP's bookshop and unofficial headquarters on the outskirts of London. In 1989, a meeting was held in the local library to discuss ways to close it down. The BNP decided to attend. All of a sudden, there was a bit of a commotion outside, um, and the door, the entrance to the hall, was just kicked in um, with a just the most ear-splitting crash you could imagine. Someone called out BNP almost simultaneously as when the doors banged open. People then jumped up and were obviously scared and worried about what was going on. People didn't know what was happening. Around 12 to 15 men burst into the room and just started attacking people. I heard a lot of people shouting BNP, BNP in very loud voices, repeated several times. Then there was a noise of glass smashing. They were kicking, punching. There was people lying on the floor and they were kicking, on, kicking them in the sides, in the face. I remember there was a pregnant woman who was beaten up by two men. A young girl, about 17, was punched in the face. A stream of mostly young men then came running up the stairs and attacked me, uh, swore a good deal, kicked me in the head, got me down on the stairs, stamped all over me. 
and they were just picking up the chairs and they were just hurling them at us. Um, and, the, and it was kind of, it was raining chairs. It was just the, the most extraordinary experience. Uh, and it was frightening. It was really, really frightening. Then an ambulance crew arrived and wanted to know who had been injured. And I think there was around 12 or 13 people who were taken to hospital. In the 90s, many leading members of the BNP acquired or renewed their criminal records. Tony Lacombe was convicted of possession of a bomb. Richard Edmonds was convicted of assaulting a black man. But for John Tyndall, head of the BNP, Crimes like this hardly count when set against the crimes of the multiracial conspirators. This country has been betrayed and sold down the river by people acting within the law. And I don't think their crimes, the crimes that have been committed against the British people by the promotion of the black invasion and the Asian invasion, the crimes committed against the British people by our being railroaded into Europe by Ted Heath and by people since Ted Heath. They are crimes as far as I'm concerned and the fact that they were crimes committed uh, within the law doesn't make them any the less crimes. What you're trying to do is to highlight a few cases of things that happened outside the law. Let's take the whole moral picture of what, is to be, of what has been done to this country largely within the law for Tyndall, it's all so simple. The BNP are fighting for the British nation's very survival. So why doesn't the British public support them? Because, the BNP believe, we've all been brainwashed. And the people doing the brainwashing are the same as ever, the Jews. There is a disproportionate number of Jews involved in all levels of the mass media, from someone like uh, Michael Grade and Jeremy Isaacs down to the producer of this program. In 1997, Nick Griffin wrote a book about alleged Jewish control of the media called Mindbenders. In it, he lists Jewish television personalities whom he believes are part of the Zionist plot. They're promoting genocide because that, under the United, Con United Nations Genocide Convention, what is being done to the British people in their own homeland is genocide. And the Jews who you list as um, partly responsible for this include um, people like um, Gabby Roslin, Danny Bear, Maureen Lipman. Are these people really worthy of your... P P uh, yeah, people, for example, a, a very recent one, Vanessa Feltz, uh, who on her shows and so on will from time to time have a dig at uh, white bigots and uh, homophobes and anti people who are anti-black and so on. I'm a bird of a feather and I'm hoping to flock with you. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What's your quarrel with Gabby Roslin? None at all. Uh, although, again, she will slot in the, the usual politically correct liberal remarks. And welcome. Thank you very much. And welcome to the programme that's all about TV. Mindbenders alleges a huge conspiracy, but it's a work of pure prejudice, not research. Disproportionate number of people, you say? Yes. And in the BBC, you seem to have found <coughs> 19 Jews in the whole of the organisation. Uh, and it goes right the way down to the head of local programmes of BBC North. Yes, but who are... Well, those, obviously, there's a very limited amount of research uh, ability, so I'm sure more people could be found. Well, you can't say it's a disproportionate number and then only come up with 19 in an organisation which has a staff of several know, thousand. Look at the top names. And not just the BBC, John through, Burt. Through, 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 through the media as a whole. No, I'm not saying it's totally controlled by Jews, obviously, because John Burt, John Burt isn't. As soon as you stand up and say that I'm proud to be British, I'm proud to be white, then you're a racist. So what does being British mean to you? And Sharon, what's it mean to you? Being British. You stumped me. 
Can I have uh, two minutes? I've got something stuck in my throat. Hang on. <laughs> <clears throat> Sharon's inability to answer highlights the BNP's biggest dilemma, one which they can't solve through modernization, violence, or anti-Semitism. The multiracial society has come so far that even they can't say who comes from where. The BNP's defining policy of repatriation has become incoherent. Supposing you are only a quarter black, will you have to go? We would look into every individual case and look at it on its merits. Well, Mr. Surely it's a simple question. Is somebody who has one black grandparent and three white grandparents white? I've told you, and I'll tell you again, and I'll go on telling you 20 more times, if I have to, that we will take each individual case on its merits. So some Isn't people it? with three white grandparents and one black that, would be white, and be others it. won't. We will decide at the time. There is a logic to repatriation which is too grim for even the leader of the BNP to articulate. The far right still wants to save the white British race. But after 40 years of multiracial society, they're not sure who to rescue anymore. They've been overtaken by history they've lost the race. Have you got Asian friends? Yes, I have. I've got, I've got a few Asian friends. What and do they think about you being in the BNP? Um, I've never had any of them turn against me for it. Um, they're still as friendly. How would you feel when uh, they had to pack their bags and leave? Well, again, it's, we, we don't know what level um, until it's tried, what level of um, repatriation is going to be. We won't know until we find out how many is actually here before I can answer that. Um, we will have to see. So it would be quite important to have a census or something or a proper sort of accounting of how many Asians there are in the country and blacks before, before you did anything? If that could be possible. That's mm. possible, yes. I think that's enough about and race, um, to be honest. Don't you? If you feel that... Succeed at that.